the work I'll be drawing on. Um, in, the, in the world of Diffit, um, our, our beloved founder, um, the world exists in fragile and non-fragile contexts. When they told us which countries that we they would appreciate us looking at, they used the CPIA assessment, uh, the scores, and said countries below this will be dealt with by other research centres. You can choose countries above this, uh, this scoring. So not only was the form of measurement uh, pretty useless if you know anything about how the World Bank views the concepts of fragility. Uh, it also limited uh, the view that we have on some of the concerns which are central to you all here. But some of the cases we looked at, uh, Rwanda, Uganda, to some extent Bangladesh, are very much countries which are still working through their histories of conflicts and the means through which they went about resolving them, the particular settlements that emerged in the post-conflicts era. So we'll be able to reflect back on that when I go through some of the findings uh, from our research today um, from, from the research centre which Christine mentioned based at Manchester. Um, <coughs> to reflect back on the extent to which the movements of countries out of conflict into particular post-conflict political power sharing arrangements shapes prospects for development, shapes the capacities of states to deliver development, shapes the commitments of political elites to develop, uh, deliver development. So it might act as some sort of segue between thinking about uh, the realist politics of political settlements and power sharing um, and the more normative politics of identifying routes towards social justice. Now, in terms of what I'll, what I'll draw attention to this morning, I was encouraged to say a few things about the basic concept itself. I'll say a little bit about political settlements analysis uh, before going on to share our findings. We've come to the end of four or five years and we've just had a workshop two weeks ago that really try to bring that, that thinking uh, together. Uh, and I'll draw to our findings across three different domains. The economic, around accumulating wealth in countries, developing countries, around redistribution, when elites decide to uh, share their rents with uh, populations, and recognition, when marginal groups become recognised and have rights accorded to them. Hopefully that means I'll only be boring some of you some of the time uh, in the <laughs> middle bit there. Hopefully that'll occur at least one of those areas is, is of interest to you. Uh, let's see. And I'll come back to some of the conclusions of where we think political settlements analysis can usefully go forward from here and reflect a little bit on the uh, overarching theme of inclusive political settlements. Okay, so our starting point is the, is the shift that has occurred over the last 10 years within international development thinking away from the discourse of saying institutions matters, which fed into the good governance agenda and the relentless promotion of all types of Western best practice institutions in developing countries as if they would provide the solution to the, the enduring uh, development problems that we saw in such contexts. Uh, these were moves which took issues of violence and conflict seriously. Uh, for Douglas North and colleagues in, in the book on violence and social orders, um, the whole problem of how societies were able to move from what they termed limited access orders into open access orders rotates around the problem of how to, of how to solve the problem of violence uh, within societies. And talks of some of the shifts you've been looking at in some of your work uh, around the points at which elites open up uh, orders to more general access to non-elite groups. Asa Mogul and Robinson undertook a similar intellectual journey away from just thinking about institutions matter to getting that it's the politics stupid, the words of James Robinson when reviewing Douglas North et al's book. Um, they use a slightly different language to refer to moves away from extractive institutions towards more open, inclusive institutions. Um, we use a slightly different language of political settlement. But it's, it's instructive to know that these are not just big books that, that you know, have circulated around the academy, but some of them have their origins within uh, the development industry itself. The, the early work by North and colleagues was funded by the World Bank. The World Bank would go on to use the language of political settlements within its WDR 2011, uh, and in the 2017 World Development Report coming up on governance, law and development. Very much engages with this turn away from thinking that it's just about institutions towards looking at power and politics as being the central drivers of why we see countries undertaking very different trajectories of dealing with problems of violence and moving towards uh, more inclusive development outcomes. <coughs> if you work for the Department of International Development, you'll be probably heartily sick 
of the term political settlements by now. Not only is there a high level policy commitment to promoting inclusive political settlements, if you work in a country office, you're very likely to have had to undertake a political settlement uh, analysis at the start of the planning cycle to inform the policy interventions, the programmatic interventions which your team will be undertaking for the next few years. And I've commissioned a whole series of sectoral studies of how the political settlement shapes this or that within particular countries. Even some NGOs have, have grasped this language and tried to integrate it into the way um, in which they work. So it's a concept with real traction um, beyond just uh, res the research world. In terms of what it, what it gives us, what does it draw our attention to, um, I, we've, uh, as Christine Centre here has been doing, have, have, have stuck with the language of political settlements rather than access orders and uh, inclusive institutions. Um, and we think of things in terms of balance or distribution of power between contending social groups and classes on which any state is based. So there's a direct shift away from thinking just in terms of formal institutions towards the forms of power that lie behind those institutions and shape the way in which they work. More specifically, how do political settlements emerge? What forms do they take? Uh, we use particularly here the work of um, Mushtaq Khan rather than Douglas North for mostly for political economy reasons. A lot of this work is this sort of, um, sort of a bit of a hallelujah moment for new, new institutional economics. They suddenly got politics. People like Mushtaq Khan, Adrian Left, which have been telling them for years and years that it's not just institution, it's about politics. But no one really, you know, in the, the, the internal political settlement of development, thinking and practice, until major economists uh, such as North or Asim Ogur and Robinson come up and say this thing, no one takes any notice. So we were quite lucky that uh, the deal uh, that which, which gave us space to talk about politics was created by leading economists. Well, we prefer the political economy work of Mushtaq Khan, um, which draws on some elements of historical institutionalism, but much more on the political economy of state building uh, literature over time. Well, what Mushtaq Khan argues is that what first needs to occur to, in, in terms of forming a political settlement is the ways in which elites centralised violence, coming together to agree that there is one central point of the legitimate means of coercion in society, an agreement to establish certain basic institutions which their first job is to distribute resources and status, we think, in line with the underlying distribution of power. If you do not have those powerful groups brought into the original deal that gets made, then you're building in problems of instability. So these are things well understood within the, the last 10, 20 years of work on peace processes and who needs to be around the table. Um, what they go further in doing, I think, in this body of work is draw attention to the processes of elite bargaining, which are fundamental to that process, which take place in often very informal ways rather than through formal institutions, are highly personalised, and because of that personalised nature of the deal-making that occurs, that influences the types of institutions that we get from these types of deals. Very limited in terms of the access of people to influence them. Um, highly personalised rather than impersonal in terms of how people get treated as a result of their engagements. The, the dominance of patronage here and patron client politics comes through strongly. And this is where Khan, I think, is more persuasive than North. Khan draws attention to this as a very rational political strategy for maintaining stability. If you're you know, wearing the seven and you get up in the morning, which groups do you worry about most uh, in terms of preserving the, some sort of territorial integrity to your state building projects? It's those other powerful groups that you may not quite have fully repressed enough or may not have fully bought in uh, to your deal, rather than necessarily worrying first and foremost about what local people are worried about. But what Khan also does is draw attention to that this is not just a cultural or a political issue, it's also a political economy issue. Uh, if you're dealing with countries where the size of the informal economy is still way bigger than the formal economy, that is, there's no way of the government generating sufficient rents through formal processes of tax generation to then um, buy in powerful groups who may threaten stability, then, of necessity, the majority of the rent generation and rent sharing gain will be off budget and informal and require these sorts of personalised pacts. And for, for Khan, it's not until economies have move through certain phases of structural transformation whereby the formal economy grows in the ways that would benefit the situation I've just mentioned, but also you have groups which are not dependent on the state as the primary site of accumulation. That is, they don't need the rents 
offered by the state in order to uh, protect protect their properties, protect their uh, sorry, not to protect their properties, but to protect their accumulation strategies, um, and therefore start to put the types of um, pressure on public institutions to provide public goods um, in a more rules-based fashion. So there's a political economy aspect to this analysis, which Carl rather than North brings in. The new institutions can't quite bring themselves to problematise capitalism. It's a little bit beyond it. They can get as far as getting into politics, but can't quite deal with the, 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 the tricky issue of capitalism. So what we get here is a theory which tells us the way about the ways in which um, governments should generate the capacity and incentives to act around development, the ways in which underlying forms of power um, are formed. And when we were looking around in 2010-11 for a political theory to glue together our programme of research into development, we were kind of two cheers for this approach. We thought, well, there's, there's real power here. This, this is fairly parsimonious, clear-headed explanation of how power works. It gets us away from some of the normative assumptions which have underpinned thinking that have clearly gone wrong in directing development policy and practice in the wrong areas. But we, there was also a sense of disquiet. Some of us come from very different intellectual traditions, more concerned with critical politics, social justice rather than just realist politics. And we thought, this, this can't be how the world operates entirely. Are we really saying that elites across the board are entirely driven by rational interest? calculations based on pure incentive-driven <coughs> calculus? Do they not have any ideas or projects for developing a, a good society? Is that, is that what we see amongst political elites? So we wanted to bring in a sense of the ideational influence of politics rather than just the materialist basis of politics. And we didn't quite think that all elites were just controlled by the structures that they were in, that they were necessarily responding to this balance of power that they found themselves within. We always thought that we would be room for manoeuvre. What Adrian Lefwich referred to as the, the games within the rules, not just the rules of the game. So a stronger role for agency. Uh, we had other problems with it that I won't go into great depth, but it comes through in some of the papers we'll discuss this afternoon, the extent to which most political analysis draws us into the nation state as the only useful bounded uh, area of analysis, whereas we know that peace processes, development processes in the post-colonial world are heavily transnationalised, always have been. Um, and so we were concerned to bring in these other ideas. So we, I wouldn't say we integrated coherently all these different ideas. We sort of bolted on things like ideas and the transnational into a loose framework and went out and tested it because this is a new language which hasn't been road tested rigorously uh, in the past, despite the apparent enthusiasm amongst development actors for it. Uh, so we were concerned that it was starting to influence policy before it had generated evidence to prove its power. So we looked around for a typology to help us frame the comparative research ambitions that we have. And then if you come across this, this diagram which Brian Levy uses to interpret Mushtaq Khan's work. Brian Levy, uh, he worked for about 20 years at the World Bank promoting public sector reform, including in some post-conflict contexts. And he's got a very sort of easy populist book on this 2014 on going with the grain. It's worth a, worth a look. And what we took from Brian's work, he's been working with us for the last five years. Um, it is this typology. Uh, it shows how you move from situations of conflict into some sort of political settlement, some means of resolving the problem of violence to a sufficient level. As your papers again show today, violence doesn't disappear even in conditions of relative political um, stability as a means of maintaining some forms of exclusive social orders. But some degree of settlement emerges. And what this, this offers is a chance to think through the terms on which um, that deal is made in the original political settlements and how that then feeds into different types um, of context. What, Khan, what using Khan uh, does is, is along this vertical axis here. So the political settlement is constituted by the balance of power according to Mushtaq Khan. But how does that shape political power shape, shape sharing agreements that are made? Not just in the immediate post-conflict era, but thereafter. And what Levy shows us here is that the balance of power shapes um, the ways in which political power works in both de jure and de facto ways. So what are the um, de jure arrangements for sharing of political power? How far do they lead towards dominance as opposed to, as opposed to more competitive settings? What are the rules of the game in terms of, the, um, continue, of, of how power changes hands between elite groups? Are there legitimate, legitimate possibilities of power changing hands between factions if there's not? that we're in a dominant setting whereby only one 
faction in society has a credible possibility of forming a ruling coalition. Whereas if you've got a more distributed balance of power in society, where there's alternative factions capable of taking power, uh, then you're more likely to be in a competitive setting. This is significant for ways I'll come back to, but what Levy adds, which Kahn doesn't have in his theory, is how this shapes the ways in which public institutions act, and this is what takes us more clearly into development. That the ways in which public institutions distribute resources <coughs> and rights uh, can be thought about as a continuum between personalised deals that get made and more impersonalised rules-based forms of governance. So how do these elites, depending on how they get power, then go on to govern the societies uh, that they rule over? Uh, do they treat people more or less as clients, distributing goods in return for political loyalty, um, or more in systemic ways, uh, systematic ways in more rules-based forms where people can start to expect to receive things as of right rather than because of their political loyalty? And the two are clearly related. There's a, there's a sense within Mushtaq Khan's work, which you've probably grasped, where he thinks dominant coalitions are the ones that are going to be the most developmental. They are going to be in power for a long period. Their long-term vision may encourage them to invest in the types of institution building required to move along this continuum. And the case of Rwanda is typically related to that. So you get a sense that the type of political settlement that gets made in Rwanda leads to dominance by a mixture of co-opting um, Hutu groups into the Tutsi minority government, also repressing, repressing any forces which wanted to go back to discussions around the politics of ethnicity, so again the twin hands of co-optation and repression very apparent there, in ways that has led to a dominant coalition with apparently a long-term vision. This is a bit different to what we see in Uganda today, um, particularly in Uganda in the first 10 years where Yaweri Museveni moves out of internal civil conflict into forming a fairly inclusive, broad-based coalition, um, inclusive of nearly all ethno-territorial groups, religious groupings in the country, of excluded groups, women included, in that, um, with the notable exception of the North, but which is increasingly being challenged by competitive pressures in ways that is leading towards more personal forms of rule. So you can understand some of the movements from the type of political settlement which gets forward into the rules of the game in terms of sharing political power and how that then shapes uh, how personalised or not um, the responses from government, government in terms of distribution of resources. Ghana is another of our cases which goes down a very different route, uh, doesn't experience the same types of conflicts as the other two countries and seeks to institutionalise inter elite competition within a two party system. Very good for stability but increasingly raising question marks about the extent to which that leads to rules based governance. The incentives created by grafting multi-party politics onto institutions which are not very strong at leads to a great deal of politicisation of the bureaucracy and has led to some people to start challenging um, the promotion of multi-party democracy uh, in areas of the world where the, the, the settlement is, has not reached a su sufficient level of stability and institutional development. So that was our starting point, that was our typology, including some post-conflict countries, and we went out and tested this theory with our bolt-on of ideas and the transnational uh, in, uh, across these different domains. I won't go through all of this, you can see uh, the, what, the different countries we looked at. There were more countries than this, I'll refer to a couple more of them today. Uh, and we looked across a whole series of different domains. Um, so this is both comparative <coughs> analysis, but within each case we took a lot of process tracing. So we looked at how the political settlement got formed in, say, post-conflict Rwanda, what did that mean uh, for how they went about developing a growth strategy, how inclusive was that, how they went about distributing health and education resources, and what they did in terms of women's rights. So it's, it's, it's process tracing which tries to identify the causal mechanisms, not just reading off from outcomes in these particular areas. Um, so let's go through a couple of the case studies, comparative case studies, and see where we got to. See if we were right to add ideas in, see if the, the post-conflict deals that were made really did shape development uh, down the line. So in terms of accumulation, uh, we looked at growth, but we also looked specifically at natural resource governance. Uh, and we looked at a problem which is beset um, some of the countries that you're looking at here as well, around the natural resource curves and the extent to which newly resource-rich countries in sub-Saharan Africa would be able to escape the so-called resource curse. And we chose 
Ghana and Uganda as examples of different types of political settlements to see how each of these countries was doing. Um, they seem to be good comparisons, partly because the, the levels of the fine, the significance of these fines, were similar in both cases. These are not new petro states, by the way. You know, the, you know, two billion barrels of oil is not a huge amount compared to Nigeria's nine or ten billion, or Angola's sorry, Nigeria, Nigeria's thirty-seven billion, or Angola's ten billion barrels of oil. But they're significant. They're kind of game-changing in the sense of displacing aid. Aid in these countries is more or less at the level. Uh, of the value of oil that would be contributed towards um, gross domestic projects. So significant for changing the, the dynamic, the political economy dynamic uh, of, of these countries. What was more significant was the political differences between these countries. By every indicator that you'd look at uh, in the formal world of uh, measuring development and democracy and governance, Ghana outstripped Uganda three times as wealthy per capita way above it on the democracy score according to policy 4, which is scores between plus 10 and minus 10. So uh, 8 for Ghana, only minus 1 for Uganda, which only moves back to multi-party politics in the mid-2000s. Every governance indicator, um, Ghana does better. Um, and so from a pure new institutionalist reading of how governance should work in developing countries, Ghana should be doing better at governing its oil in, in the national interest compared to Uganda. So we, we went out to explore that in terms of three areas. We wanted to know whether one country was putting in better rules for governing this through a legislative process, whether which country was being more open and accountable, transparent in its process, and which country was getting better deals for uh, the national interest. What, was it generating resources that could be used for developmental purposes down the line? We found quite a surprising thing, surprising at least from a new institutionist perspective. Corruption was there across the board, shaped very much by the nature of the ruling coalition. Though. So the, the corruption was primarily party political in Ghana, whereas in Uganda it reflected the, the narrow inner core of people that Museveni increasingly relies on to maintain um, his power and a much stronger role for the military. Um, the military still plays a very dominant role within uh, Ugandan social order in a way that's not apparent um, in Ghana. Uganda is a dominant-ish political settlement, increasingly vulnerable, whereas Ghana's is highly competitive, very strong chances of electoral turnover um, between the two main parties. Um, the whole little, uh, a runoff in the last election, we we're talking about 51-49% types of difference between the two countries. Uh, this created huge incentives for uh, the government to move very swiftly towards producing oil before it put in place any legislative arrangements uh, to actually govern oil. So Uganda breaks, sorry, Ghana breaks all records of moving towards um, the production of oil in three years between 27 and 2010 um, and makes deals with oil companies before it has any new institutional arrangements for doing so. Uganda does the opposite. The president takes a long-term view sits around the, the table with oil companies for prolonged periods, refuses to do deals until he thinks the deals are in the, in the country's best interest, and actually withholds deal-making until those legislative arrangements are in place. Those legislative arrangements that are in place are, are not perfect. They put too much power in the hands of the executive, and there's a big parliamentary backlash against that, which was, again, surprising. Um, the president has to bring MPs to State House eight times to convince them to finally vote the way he actually wants them to vote. He normally just buys them off or just intimidates them once. Um, whereas the political party response in Ghana was much more in, um, weak, uh, to be frank. Um, they toe the party line, where there are institutional arrangements in place to offset the Dutch disease effects of oil, such as um, provisions in the Public Revenue Management Act to prevent the, go the government from borrowing against future earnings. MPs pass that law, and then the ruling party votes against it. So they can collateralise debt, get in a major loan from China, and then leads to the problems that we see with Ghana going through macroeconomic crisis and the IMF coming back into an austerity programme. So MPs don't act according to the national interest but follow partisan lines there in ways that undermine public institutions around protecting national interest. And finally, in terms of deals, it's not just us. We, we, we were really surprised actually to find that Uganda gets significantly better shares from its deals with international oil companies uh, compared to Ghana. Um, civil society groups, the IMF, lots of other people have found exactly the same thing. 
A lot of this is the extent to which each country has invested in building state capacity. So in Ghana and Uganda, you, you have strong, highly trained civil servants who are, should be in charge of the sector. But in Ghana, they're not allowed to do their job. They seem to be too closely linked to the National Democratic Congress Party, uh, which, is, uh, which is true, historically it was formed when you had a dominant party in power in the, in the, in the early 1980s. When the National Patriotic Party comes in, they see it's been a creature of the, the opposition party and decimates it. 90% of people are shifted out, deals are made by special advisers rather than trained oil technocrats with correspondingly weaker, less ordered deals. Museveni, when he comes into power, finds that he doesn't have any geoscientists with relevant training, tells the international oil companies to go away until he's built up a cadre of people who are credible, who eventually then go on to make the deals in ways that he, allow, he allows them to do. In Ghana, the oil companies just play, played off bureaucrats against politicians because they always knew there was someone else they could talk to. In Uganda, they knew it was the president or the oil technocrat. That was it, the, the, the leading three oil technocrats around the table. So they couldn't engage in that type of game playing. Uganda ends up with better deals, um, significantly above the African average. Um, this, I hasten to say, is, doesn't mean that Uganda will be richer or distribute these revenues better than Ghana. We've got serious doubts about that, again, because of the nature of the political settlements uh, in each country, but we can perhaps come to that. What's interesting is that the ways in which politics shape the capacity of the state uh, to act in the national interest here. Redistribution, so moving away from accumulating, generating wealth, um, what does it mean in terms of redistributing wealth? To what extent do uh, elites start to bring in um, social groups into the uh, political settlement via, via the distribution uh, of resources? We looked at three areas, social protection, education and health. Social protection coverage rates are notoriously difficult to, to capture, so I would try, treat this data carefully, but Amongst our five countries, again, it's a story of dominant parties doing much better in terms of their commitment to social protection, both in terms of social assistance, major cash transfer programs of giving money to poor people without conditions largely, also in terms of social insurance, which is much more difficult to do, persuading people to pay into something which may get delivered at very different levels by governments of more or less competence. Let's think mainly with the Sexual development story of just giving money to the poor. Um, you can see that countries like um, Ethiopia and Rwanda, where dominant uh, coalitions are in power, have managed to reach uh, much more, much higher proportions of their population in, and in a much more pro poor manner than governments which are either competitive, pantheistic, or are moving away from dominant to more competitive settings, as in the case of uh, Uganda, which is the weakest um, performer here. Um, this is not just a story of external influence, our transnational issues coming in, it's very much a story of political settlements and ideas, ideas of political elites. So in terms of what you require to move to some type of commitments in capacity to deliver social protection effectively, we looked at three different things. Is it about the, the nature of the political settlement and power relations within that? Is it about ideas? Or is it just about a policy coalition driven by international donors, whether it's DFID, World Bank, UNICEF, promoting these ideas from outside. And we found that the international effect is not even necessary, let alone sufficient, um, to be a factor here. In Rwanda, what matters here is that in 2005 to 6, there's a dip in the poverty reduction figures, and that generates a crisis of legitimacy within the ruling elite. They start realising that unless they can be seen, to be generating resources which are being distributed evenly across society, and their claims to be ruling in uh, the interests of all groups in society are under threat. And so with po poverty figures going up, um, they see that as being a risk to the core of the, the political settlement which they formed, uh, which was based on a promise not to be um, exclusive, um, but to be universal and to, to be promoting uh, development as, as part of its legitimacy, as well as and maintaining stability. <coughs> so once that crisis sets in, they go around looking for a policy instrument that can provide that answer. They come up with not cash transfers in the typical um, sense that DFID have been promoting, um, but they come up with a public sector, uh, a, a productive safety nets program, very similar to the Ethiopian model, um, which fits in with an earlier program they had. 
And so this fits in with their productivist development strategy of making Rwanda a more productive, economically developed nation rather than a welfareist nation. And it's that which drives the policy. Similarly, in Ethiopia in 2005, the idea does come from outside. But until you have a crisis within the ruling coalition, and in this case, moving up to the 2005 elections and realising they're nowhere near as popular as they thought and are seeking other means of maintaining their legitimacy, social protection and other social policy initiatives come through as the means by which that legitimacy is, is, is bound together um, again uh, with a major focus on this. They also see food security as a security issue. They see stability as being under threat from the food security crisis they experienced in the early 2000s. And see this as an adequate policy response. Whereas in none of our other cases is there, is there a significant shift in the nature of the political settlements. Kenya, you could argue, with the political instability after the 2007-8 election, maybe fits into that, and there's a need, given the crisis, the political crisis, to then use social protection to bring people back into some type of social contract. But you see more limited response there. And because none of these governments down here have got the <coughs> capacity that being a dominant regime offers you to deliver um, social goods effectively, then what you tend to see is cash transfers being lost in a web of patron prime politics within these other countries. I think particularly Zambia um, and Uganda. Although it's interesting in Kenya, rather than deliver on the basis of need, um, a significant proportion, a third of cash transfers, are delivered via the constituency development fund, which enables politicians to be the ones uh, giving out the goodies. Um, so again, whether or not this, this constitutes moves towards a new social contract as opposed to uh, reinforcing patriot plant politics is questionable. And briefly in terms of... Okay, so this isn't the new... Yeah, unfortunately. Okay, it's the old one. Sorry, sorry. I, was too, I was too late in setting through. I, I noticed a glitch in our slide. So, you're going to have to imagine Bangladesh on this one. So this is how well countries have done in terms of um, reducing maternal mortality. And here the dominant story starts becoming less persuasive. To some extent, Rwanda, the green line, by far the, 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 the uh, achieving the highest rates of progress in terms of reducing maternal mortality, admittedly from a, a high starting point and very much within the context of, uh, of dealing up, up the post-conflict uh, dividends and coming through strongly there. But our in-case process tracing shows very much that you, um, Rwanda was able to enforce um, different rules and regulations within the health sector in terms of are on the supply side in terms of the ways in which healthcare professionals treated women um, at, at, within healthcare centres, within the whole delivery um, process, trying them into the system, um, and the persuasive efforts of getting women to actually attend birth centres with trained practitioners. Strong, strong top-down enforcement <coughs> uh, within the state. But what's interesting, if we have Bangladesh here to show you, is that Bangladesh is the next best performer, and Bangladesh is anything but dominant party system. It's been highly competitive um, since the um, early 1990s. Um, but the deal that gets formed in the post-conflict moments um, by uh, elites following the, the, the fight between Eastern, uh, West and Pakistan, the devastation wrought by that conflict um, on the country, uh, there is an, uh, an enduring commitment to social provision, <coughs> also informed by the famine that was uh, uh, experienced by the country in the early 1970s thereafter. Now this, the imaginary very good performance of Bangladesh on here is not achieved through dominant states uh, enforcing uh, public sector officials to work in particular ways. Much more co-produced effort by NGOs, notably BRAC and others, um, working with local government to ensure that um, issues of gender equity and in this case maternal mortality are taken seriously at the front line of service provision. And this starts to show that there's different routes to similar types of outcomes um, across different countries. That it's not just a case of dominant countries doing better with um, all development tasks as compared to competitive cases. And that comes through also in education, where you actually see you know, all countries doing pretty well in terms of access because it's a no-brainer to get kids into school. It suits everyone's interests, um, politically as well as developmentally. But in terms of whether kids are actually learning anything in school, which is a much trickier challenge, how do you get teachers to turn up, how well trained are these teachers and diligence are actually delivering um, and keeping kids on, t on task um, in the classroom, is a much more difficult task. And what we're starting to show here is that the dominant settlements that people think are good for resolving problems of conflict and good for delivering on development 
challenges may come up against certain frontiers where the governance tasks that need to be delivered are much more transactional than logistical. That if it requires changing the behaviour of people at multiple levels, um, then that may be the task which top-down hierarchical governance is not as well suited to as, as <coughs> some, some celebrants of dominant regimes uh, of, of held in power. So Rwanda here, the grey line, does actually less well than other countries. And this is partly because the president in Rwanda makes <coughs> Uh, uh, one of his high modernist decisions to, to convert the whole of education from French to English language before doing, conducting a, an assessment of whether teachers were capable of delivering that. And only about 14-15% of teachers are actually capable of giving quali high quality instruction in the English language. Um, and so the pursuit of ideas at a higher level um, undermines capacity and the, the ability of schools in Rwanda in this case to actually deliver on high quality learning as opposed to delivering on high levels of access. And again, a political settlements analysis is useful here. It can help tell us where the balance of power lies around particular policy issues and domains. If you do a multi-stakeholder power analysis of who's holding together which agenda in different countries, it's clear that political leaders, teaching unions, the rural majority, are all in favour of the access agenda. But the types of Actors who would be in favour of high quality public goods being provided, and this holds beyond education for other types of public goods, are not really powerful. Uh, the, the middle classes, the types of capital that require high skilled labourers, lack the type of uh, political influence which uh, could lead to a stronger focus on, on learning. Recognition, which I know is a concern within um, political settlements research programme here, will be a very strong focus of your research, uh, of your discussions tomorrow. Um, particularly around gender. Um, and what we found here, we looked specifically at two things. Under what conditions do women become included in uh, political settlements and formal political institutions? And to what extent does that lead to influence over gender equity outcomes in terms of policies being adopted and promoted and implemented um, in favour of gender equity? And again, our four cases here show different events. To some extent, this is back to the competitive versus dominant story of how development unfolds. Uh, but what's more important initially is that if we want to understand the terms on which women get included within political processes, we do need to go back to the original formation of the political settlement. And what's striking here is that by far the most democratic country in our sample, Ghana, is the one without a quota for women MPs and with the lowest levels of representation of female MPs. And we trace this back through the political settlement story of these different countries. And in particular, uh, the ways in which women and women's rights and entitlements were or were not politicised during the formation of those political settlements. So in Bangladesh, Rwanda and Uganda, um, the role that women played either as victims of conflicts and uh, sustained atrocities um, undertaken by Pakistan, uh, West Pakistani soldiers on Bangladeshi women um, in 1970-71 in particular, creates political entitlements for women to be included, which directly informs the claim making that gets made there. Similar in terms of the genocide in Rwanda, but also the role that women play within the conflict, supporting the resistance movements and armed movements in Uganda and Rwanda, is taken seriously there. <coughs> women play a key role in the constitution making process in those countries um, over, the, over the prolonged period of, uh, of, of setting up the new institutional arrangements in those countries, which leads to um, a commitment to their inclusion. Now, does that inclusion mean, and this isn't the only question to ask of inclusion, obviously it's a very instrumental way of thinking about it that we critique elsewhere, but one question to ask of inclusion is does it lead to uh, better gender equity outcomes down the line, or at least the adoption of gender equity policies? And we looked at the passage of domestic violence legislation. And what's interesting is that the more competitive countries actually took much longer to move towards adopting legislation than the dominant settings. That the political marketplace within these competitive settings of Bangladesh and Ghana made it very difficult for women's voices and interests to gain, gain traction. <coughs> um, the political parties are not particularly programmatic in either of these cases, not particularly open to being persuaded around the normative value uh, of agendas. And the types of capital that are required to play games in clientelistic settings, the financial capital, required to manoeuvre in rent sharing agreements, the social capital to be involved in the informal deals that take place behind closed doors are highly gendered 
uh, and not in women's favour. And so it actually takes quite a lot longer to get things through here. Bangladesh things only got through in 2010 when a caretaker government in power. Politics is normally suspended. The technocrats, one of whom used to be a feminist within the women's movement, helps mobilise the women's movement and creates a, an alliance between technocrats and social movements while the politicians are out of the way. That's the only way it could work in Bangladesh. Luckily, the Islamist party are also being taken to court at this time, so their veto role on such progressive legislation is also undermined. So the fiscal settlement analysis can tell us quite a lot about how that legislation got through in that case. In Uganda and Rwanda, in one case it's a story of dominance, an early commitment to women's empowerment, filtering through later legislative moves. But it actually occurs in very different ways in these two settings, which draws attention to the extent to which a commitment to women's rights is highly instrumental in Uganda, and much more is logical in Rwanda. Um, Museveni only agrees, it moves quite quickly here, 2008 to 10, because the president agrees to this, but he agrees because it's diluted legislation. It rules out much more controversial issues around marital rape and co-ownership of resources, and doesn't challenge male autonomy in the same ways um, as early legislation has already done in Rwanda, uh, where for party instrumental reasons around rural productivity, issues of co-ownership have already been dealt with um, legislatively. So this is just... This doesn't require a big campaign to pass things in Rwanda. Normal legislative process um, uh, is undertaken uh, to ensure the passage of this, and then it becomes implemented. Not perfectly across the territory, but in terms of just one indicator, the number of shelters that are, are rolled out, nine out of 30 districts. Uh, there's five in, uh, in Bangladesh, but if we look at the population levels there, there's no comparison really. Whereas in other countries, Ghana, they haven't even got an action plan in place yet to actually deliver. Um, and are reliant more on non-governmental uh, activities, uh, as is Uganda, to deliver on this. So very different levels of um, commitment to women's rights emerging from the nature of uh, different types of political settlement and different types of ideas um, around women's empowerment in these settings. So our research starts to identify. Uh, I'll skip through this because uh, I've just seen the seen just showing the time on this, but these were identified two different types of trajectory. And there's a sort of dominant mode of trajectory which involves a, a, rule, a dominant ruling coalition with high levels of elite cohesion buying in horizontally across different elite groups, tied together with some sort of paradigmatic vision uh, which underpins the original settlement and drives forward a move towards more legitimate forms of development down the line, <coughs> but which really importantly is enforced by high levels of state capacity. In the competitive settings that we find, it's actually much more difficult to deliver things because of the uh, incentives to be to think in short terms way and the ways in which multi-party politics can heavily fragment and politicise public bureaucracies. Nonetheless, you do find a great deal of development success in such cases. Um, where these come, they tend to come less through elite cohesion and dominant projects, much more through multi-stakeholder coalitions, think of maternal mortality in Bangladesh, also health and education at a local level in education and health in Ghana and Uganda. It's delivered through multi-stakeholder coalitions of state, non-state actors coming together in a way that offsets these broader dysfunctionalities of how politics works um, in such settings, at least in developmental terms. In terms of, if you're going to look at the political settlements as an organising concept for how it's shaping developments um, and post-conflict trajectories in, in, in your countries as well, which, which aspects have we found to be most important? Um, the first thing is that we think it helps explain pathways to development. We don't think it's useful to think, okay, dominant settings are more developmental than competitive settings. What's more important is that the ways in which these countries can develop differs according to the type of settlement. As in maternal mortality, you can get to similar levels, but the ways in which you do that is going to be different. And therefore, your interventions to support those efforts should be accordingly different. It wouldn't make any sense to go into Rwanda and insist on lots of bottom-up social accountability measures where the top-down system is working well. Likewise, it doesn't make sense to go into Bangladesh or Ghana and say, let's reform the system from the top down. There's just too many political factors that will stop that working. Much more useful to think of multi-stakeholder coalitions. We do find that ideas really matter, and this also offers a, a means of engagement. That elites are not purely driven by material uh, balances of power and interests, but also by ideological commitments to particular forms of development, particular nation-building projects. 
It's not a structural game. Dynamics really matter. The formation of physical settlements, um, who's in and on what terms, shapes, trajectories moving forward. And once a physical settlement is in, is, in, um, is in place, that's not the end of the game. There's lots of games take place within those. Lots of shifting balances of power between elites that open up opportunities for more marginal groups to gain access to them, as we see with the women's movement taking the opportunity um, in Bangladesh. We do still see that this issue of horizontal power, that is the deal struck between elites, is the dominant driver of the game in what I think North is right to call limited access orders. But most of the action we see, particularly in the cumulative sectors around growth, natural resource governance, is driven by the types of deals that get made between elites. Once we start moving into the more social uh, and cultural and political domains, um, then the vertical relations between elites and social groups does matter more. Not in a sort of simple way that the old participatory empowerment, social accountability literature told us was the case, that it's all about empowerment from the grassroots up. We don't find any real evidence of that um, as being a significant driver of progressive development outcomes. It's much more significant that strategically placed social actors generate alliances with elites in relation to openings that are, shaped, that are created by horizontal shifts in power relations that matter. And that is really the coalitions that are capable of, of doing that. Um, what does this mean in terms of inclusive political settlements? We do think that the ways in which countries move out of conflict really matters. The nature of the political settlement, the nature of inter elite bargains, moving into the nature of elite mass deals, and the founding ideas that come through in, in, at those moments really matter. What we haven't done, and it's perhaps an issue for our work going forward, is to go back and look in more depth at those peace agreements that were made. In Uganda, Rwanda, going all the way back to the 70s in Bangladesh, who was sitting around the table in those very early stages and how did that shape the nature of the coalitions that got formed and then the nature of the development that took place? We need to do more process tracing around that, those very specific linkages. We've got some broad ideas but we need more depth on that. We do challenge the language of inclusion. We do think it's much more about modalities of power, the ways in which people are incorporated. What political settlements analysis gives us is essentially a relational understanding of how power works. And thinking simplistically in terms of level of inclusion doesn't really help us grasp that very clearly. We need to know the modes through which elites seek to incorporate citizens or clients. Is it a rule or is it a deal? Uh, these are things which shape uh, the nature of, um, of development and stability. And we do sort of caution against the push from Asi Mogu and Robinson and others that in any given situation, if you have a choice, you go for an inclusive institution rather than a more closed institution. We don't find that to hold across all areas of development. Some areas, particularly around economics, uh, don't really require openness in the initial stages, at least, even if that's not the case in more social areas. So two final points to, to finish on. Um, I don't think political settlement analysis can give us the answer to everything. It's not a catch-all theory that can, that can displace other long-run theories of how conflict emerges, becomes resolved and moves into more progressive development trajectories. Mm -hmm. To me and to East, I think it's a more a mid-range theory uh, that can explain the more proximate ways in which capacity and commitment emerges within the context of certain power relations. And this is the key to it really. The reason why many of us agree or disagree on what Christine will talk about next in terms of what we mean when we talk about political settlements it's basically because we have very different understandings of power, of what we mean by power. And what Khan and others gives us is a very, I think, limited, positivist, realist perspective on power. That is at odds with what many of us understand power to be. That it's not just about material incentive-driven power. That power is something which is constructed, is more agential in character, is ideational as well as material. Um, and involves more complex interactions of agency and structure than is allowed for within the mainstream analysis of political settlements. And I think going forward we'll see a division between different types of political settlement analysis, some of which is more realist and positivist, uh, more fixed typologies and more probably going into accounting and quantitative work. And I think from what I can gather uh, the ways in which work is more likely to go here, a more critical constructivist route. Uh, more ideational, more able to understand and grasp the forms of power, intangible forms of power, which shape relations of domination and resistance 
and can't be captured by uh, the more positivist approaches. Um, well, there's also a series of strategic implications that flow from this. I've run out of time, so I won't go into these in any great detail. Uh, but I think this does have a lot of implications for policy. It largely fits with what many people have been saying about the move, need to move away from good governance, Western best practice type of ideals into what Mary Lee Grindle calls good enough governance, understanding phases of moving through stability, state capacity, accountability, um, that opening up some public institutions to too much openness and pressure from democratic forces before those institutions have got sufficient strength to deal with those can create problems. So there might be trade-offs between openness and capacity at certain stages of development. <coughs> Strong support for working on coalitions for change emerged from our work. So this isn't about promoting particular policies, but working about how do you shift the relations of power that can put that can <coughs> hold in place more progressive policies. And we do think it, it suggests a much more contextualised approach to working uh, on issues of conflict and development that thinks through the types of contexts which are shaped by different types of political settlements and adapts pro um, processes of in intervention accordingly with this. We do challenge the, the view from the going with the grain type literature on this, which tends to be one of the most problematic finds of this research for practitioners who get into this from a sense of commitment to social justice and are then told by this realist type of analysis that you can't really promote all of those things now, you have to wait for quite a while before that becomes possible. Um, we do find some evidence for that, that more realist understandings are required. And we also find that going with the grain can also have real problems. That if we accept existing power relations and only seek to work within them rather than challenging them, what you can end up with is often very diluted forms of policy agendas, whether on women's empowerment or cash transfers, which get captured by and perpetuate unequal relations of power, whether around patronage or instrumental use of, of women's empowerment. So we do think there's more room for pushing against the grain than others have previously drawn attention to. We significantly doubt that whether or not the international development community is in a position to be at the forefront of dealing with these types of problems. The apolitical world of aid hasn't shifted uh, in line with its thinking. It's, a, it's a, Institutional drivers, the political settlement of development in donor countries is not yet amenable um, to allowing development agencies to work in the much more adaptive, politically attuned ways that are required to take this type of analysis, analysis seriously at this moment and creates a real contradiction around the shifts from theory to practice. Um, but that, that's where we've got to so far. It's a work in progress and we look forward to hearing your comments back on that and particularly how it might match up and join up with the type of thinking uh, being done here. So yeah, thanks. Okay, thank you very much.